if you haven't been here the last couple of days, you're very fortunate. You didn't hear my longest sermons, and and uh, they won't be as long today for obvious reasons. Um, but but um, uh, hopefully, again, we'll have something that you can uh, take with you that will be beneficial. And so Carolyn asked me to remind everybody, if you'd like, we have some of the... Uh, uh, the 30-day challenge material, obviously, it does not cost anything. Take whatever you think you might be able to use or pass along to friends, um, and, and uh, 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 hopefully that'll help with, with Bible studies. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, my nose always runs 52 uh, uh, weeks a year, so it's, it's probably not COVID this time, especially since it seems like I've just had it about a month ago. Uh, but but uh, I understand y'all have had the uh, uh, every every bug and cold and flu going through in the last couple of months, uh, and so I know it's a uh, it's just the typical time of year and challenging with with some other atypical things going on also. So glad glad you're here and well this morning. We're going to open up our our Bible class with a word of prayer, and and Kurt, I wonder if you would mind offering that that uh, Kurt's. Amen. Thank you. We, we looked at this, I believe, uh, a few years ago as, as the theme for the entire gospel meeting. But I like this for a Bible class because we can kind of talk about it a little bit. And y'all can, uh, if you would like, and, and let me encourage you to do so, uh, to, to add comments that, that will help. Uh, the first part of this uh, will be mainly reading. And so uh, I'm going to try and, and uh, break it up a little bit so, so you don't fall asleep. If you do, uh, your snoring will not bother me, uh, and I'll know that I need to put a little expression into my reading. So good to see Tom. I hadn't, hadn't I was, I was telling, telling everyone I've been really glad to see the different ones I haven't been able to see yet. Good to see Thomas. I, I, told, I asked Kimberly if Jared had passed along my message that we had missed her, and, and uh uh, Kimberly said, I believe what he said was, I'm glad she wasn't there because she would talk so much. So, so any, any messages y'all have heard like that probably uh, originated more from Kurt than they did from me. So, and let me say something about Kurt. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I think y'all are really, I know y'all are really fortunate to have him, in my estimation, one of the best uh, preacher types you can get are people who do not take themselves too seriously, but who take God absolutely seriously. And I think that's the right perspective. Um, and, and so um, we, we keep y'all in our prayers and, and uh, certainly are, uh, uh, feel like y'all are, 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 not only are y'all very fortunate to have Kurt uh, working here, but I know Kurt uh, and Vicki are, are in, incredibly fortunate to have y'all uh, and so um, this is this is just a um, y'all are a beautiful congregation, and and uh, I just really appreciate. Um, uh, we always love coming here. I don't know why y'all keep inviting me back. Um, I, I <laughs> uh, uh, other than I have this I have this theory, and I've told people um, about that. I'm assuming that Kurt. Uh, has salary renegotiations uh, every so often, and just before he does, he has me come down <laughs> so that he's got something to take as a base and say, you know, it could be worse. And the okay, um, Noah uh, is such a familiar um, uh, uh, history to us. 
And, and yet there are some in the world who look at Noah and the ark, and unfortunately, there are some in the religious world who look at Noah and the ark as a story. If it's a story, you can throw out the rest of the Bible because it is presented by God as a historical account. And so it's, a very, it's very important that we don't uh, start looking at anything other than where there is an allegory that says this is an allegory or where Christ is talking about a parable. It will be like something. Um, uh, when, when, when we read something like this, uh, you will notice uh, the historical basis for this and the documentation. And it starts back in Genesis 5.21. We're going to start with Enoch, who I also like to call Elihu. If I call a name wrong, that's, uh, you, you adjust that name, but it will also encourage you to look these scriptures up for yourself and not rely on me. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Who's the other person in scripture that we read about that did not taste physical death? He was a prophet. Pardon? Also started with an E. It was Elijah. He, he, went, he went up. He was taken up into heaven. Did you say Elijah? Well done. So... There's, there's no big prize, but I do carry mints uh, sometimes for the little ones as bribes. And so uh, if you'll remind me, I'll give you a mint afterward. Um, but, but Enoch was, was an incredible uh, man. Uh, and, and he raised Methuselah. And there's something interesting about Methuselah. And we'll talk about that in a moment. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. I don't know how to pronounce any of these names. <laughs> but neither do you. So, so just, just take it for what it is. Um, after he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah lived 969 years, and then he died. When Lamech lived 182 years, he had a son named Noah. Well, if you add the 187 years old that Methuselah was when he had Lamech, to the 182 years old that Lamech was when he had Noah, you come up with 369 years for uh, Noah's grandfather, Methuselah, when Noah was born. And that'll, that'll become important a little bit later. After Noah was 500 years old, verse 32, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We're not sure exactly how long after he turned 500 for uh, 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 Ham and Japheth, but we know by reading Genesis 11:10, that Shem was a, turned 100 years old two years after the flood. And we're assuming that's two years after the flood began, not after it ended, because we're told later on that Noah lived 350 years after the flood and died at 950, and he was 600 when the flood started, 601 when he got off the ark. So very likely Noah was 502 years old when Shem was born, just Bit of trivia, um, no, no extra charge for this. Verse uh, chapter six and verse one, and this is where we start to get to the meat of, of what we want to look at this morning. When men began to increase in number on earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful. They married any they chose. Lots of theories on exactly what this meant. I have a very uh, theological answer for this, and that's, I don't know. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. Um, it means what it means, and, and uh, I'm, I'm fine with that. There are some things that God does not explain in detail that we don't have to, therefore, know the details. And so be satisfied with that, and, and don't get lost in the weeds on these things, because th this historical event is very important for us to, to uh, understand. The Lord said, my spirit will not in, uh, contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. Uh, and there are, two, there are two thoughts on this. One is that eventually man's years would reduce physically to 120 years. And if you look at that today, that's about the limit. You might see somebody actually live to 123 years or something else in the Guinness Book of World's Record. But, but uh, so possibly that could be. But the other, the other thought, and I think this is probably closer to the mark, 
is at this time when God just determined, I'm not going to let this happen much longer. I think he set a date for 120 years from that time that the flood would begin. Whether, whether you agree with me on this or not, we can still be friends because quite frankly, I don't know for certain. <laughs> if it's 120 years before the flood, it is 22 years before Shem is born. And if that's correct, then Noah has been working on the ark, or at least God determined uh, what was going to happen 22 years before Shem was born. I have an idea this ark took every year that was needed during that time. And so if that's true, uh, think about this. It's very possible that Noah was working on the ark for 22 years before his first son was born. And so, uh, and I have an idea that if Noah was working on the ark, that Mrs. Noah, whose name we don't have, was just as busy or busier. And so we get to this part. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great, this is the key, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, that every inclination of the thought of his heart was only evil all the time. Can you imagine getting to the point where wickedness was such that men's thoughts were only evil all the time? And I think we don't really have to imagine that at times, because sometimes it seems like we are surrounded by that in our own society. This is, this is where the church comes in. This is why it's so important for us uh, to be carrying on Christ's um, uh, great commission, not just for the apostles, but for us as well. The idea of making disciples, the idea of carrying on his work. The Son of Man came into the world to seek and save the lost. That's what we're to do as well. And it's a great mission. It only helps people. And so, but at this time, it had gotten so bad that every inclination of their hearts were only evil all the time. Verse 6, the Lord was grieved. He had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why God gets so concerned with what we are doing and thought, well, what I do doesn't affect anybody else? To fill the heart of the Creator with pain, I suspect, has eternal ramifications. If it's not taken, I know it does. If it's not taken care of. But just Think of your own parents. If you have a good relationship with your parents, uh, your grandparents, um, and, and just think about, I, I wouldn't do anything to, to fill their heart with pain. I have, but I, I, as I look back over the time, I'm certainly ashamed of that, but I, I wouldn't want to do that and to think that we do that to God when we sin. It does affect uh, others, and especially when we talk about the Lord. He said, I'll wipe mankind whom I've created from the face of the earth. And then he gives the account of Noah in verse 9. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Where else have we seen that phrase, he walked with God? Pardon? We certainly see it with Job. Who did we just read about, though? Enoch. Enoch, we're told, walked with God. He walked with God for 300 years. And because of that, God took him without tasting physical death. Um, Noah walked with God, and of all the people on the face of the earth, he was the one that God identified as, this is the one who will continue um, uh, his eternal purpose. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, and you realize that God's eternal purpose uh, is critical to our lives. He accomplished his eternal purpose, by the way, in who? In Jesus, in Christ. And so, uh, but isn't it interesting to know that we're part of God's eternal purpose? It was accomplished in Christ, and we have our part in that purpose. Noah certainly did. He walked with God, and so God used Noah. Look, he, then he gives him the specifications of the ark, 450 feet long. That's about a city block and a half. Some of y'all have been to see the, the re replication of the ark in Kentucky. Our family's planning on doing that in October of this year. 
uh, looking forward to, I can't imagine something that's a block and a half long, that's 75 feet wide. That's about um, the, the width of most uh, lots. And then it's 45 feet tall, about five stories tall. This is, this is something that would have been seen. Now, if you're making something of that magnitude, <laughs> And, and we just said that said what was going to happen. What does that mean? You're making something that big. What's going to happen? People are going to see it. What does that mean? You better have an explanation for why you're doing it. In the New Testament, Noah is referred to as a preacher of righteousness. We do not know if the people of that time had the opportunity to repent and get on the ark and so save themselves. We don't, we don't have any idea about that. It may very well have been that Noah was an incredibly effective preacher and, and that there were people who died in the flood or who died just before the flood who were in a saved situation. We don't know. And, and we should not presume on this that Noah was not a good preacher. Or it may very well have been that Noah was the best preacher ever and he just he, it, it fell on deaf ears. But the neat thing is, and, and the important, one of the important things about this is when you build something of that magnitude, you better be convicted and you better be able to explain why you're doing that. Um, well, it, uh, in, in verse 22, it says, Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. What do you suspect would have happened if Noah hadn't done everything just as God had commanded? Think the ark would have floated? Do you think that God would have sent the animals to him to be loaded up on a vessel that he had been tasked with building that he didn't do it in God's way? I, I don't think there is any reason for us to think that he would have done that, but there's every reason for us to understand from this historical account that God was pleased with what Noah did. And we're going to find that out later, but Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. This is a standard for us that we need to understand. The New Testament will tell you God's plan of salvation. It will tell you how he expects you to live today, all the different commandments that we have today. It will give you a pattern for worship that if we are wise, we'll try and stick as close to as we can, just like the pattern of salvation, just like the pattern for our lives. We may not do it perfectly, but we must try to do it perfectly. And, and, and when it says Noah did everything just as God had commanded him, I suspect you will... Uh, you will find, if we were able to, to determine this, that God helped Noah every step of the way to be able to accomplish that. And so uh, verse 1 of chapter 7, the Lord said to Noah, go in the ark, you and who else? Old family, for I've found you righteous in this generation. By saving himself, what else did Noah do? He saved his family. The New Testament will talk about that. And so um, I need to look at a clock every once in a while and see where we're at. How, what time does this stop, this, this class? 45 and 50. So y'all oh, give way too much time to your teachers. We give 35 and 40. So, But I've been preaching and teaching there for a lot of years. And so you have to, you have to make adjustments. The Lord said, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous. Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, two of every kind of the unclean animals. Seven days from now, I'll send a rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And now we see again, Noah did everything as God commanded. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came on the earth. Well, we're familiar with all of that. In the 600th year, verse 11 of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and floodgates of the heaven were open. If you ever get a chance uh, to see a series by a group of Christian scientists that may be one of the greatest scientific undertakings uh, that's happened in recent years, uh, and you, some of you will have seen this, but it's called Genesis is History. And it is amazing how they go back to 
everything from archaeology to geology, and they show how all these things uh, just fall into place when you go by the scriptures. Uh, but, but one of the interesting things they talk about is this idea of the springs of the great deep bursting forth. Do you remember when the land and the water were created, what we're told about the land? All together in one place. The water was all together in one place. Well, they talk about this in is Noah history and in other areas um, uh, that, that I have seen in, in scientific literature. Uh, and they talk about the continental drift, which is something that most scientists look at and agree has happened, especially when they see that the soil type over here that seems to match the contours of something that's over here 600 miles away or 1600 miles away or whatever matches the soil content over here. How did that happen? Well, it very well could have happened either during the flood or after the flood. We don't know. There's a lot of things we don't know about. Uh, we don't know why people lived to 950 or more years at this time. But never, never forget this, especially when you might be tempted either to scoff or to listen to scoffers. The creator of the universe can manipulate his creation in any way he desires. He spoke it into being. For him to do anything or to change anything would be nothing that is out of what we already know of the creator's power, unlimited power. And so as we go through this and you look at this historical event, you can kind of start seeing some of the things that could have happened. And, and I believe science will, will help uh, you to build a greater faith within the word of God. In Romans chapter one, there is a passage, uh, I believe it's verses 18 through 20, where it talks about uh, the men who reject God. And, and he talks about the fact that by what has been created, that men can see what they need to know about God. Obviously, we can't know his plan of salvation. We can't know about Christ. We're not talking about that. But we can know everything we need to know about God as far as who he is, about his, his um, uh, orderliness, about his power. You start looking at the creation and something as simple, I shouldn't say as simple, but as complex as a beetle, the Bombardier beetle uh, is how I've heard it pronounced. It doesn't sound right to me, but it's called the Bombardier beetle. And the Bombardier beetle has two uh, tubes running out the back of its body, and they have different chemicals that God has put within those tubes. And when the Bombardier beetle is threatened, it shoots the liquid out these two tubes, and when they mix, they create a chemical reaction that is essentially something that is meant to boil and sting its enemy. How could something like that evolve? And of course, we know how something like that could evolve because unbelieving scientists have told us, well, it took millions of years and then hundreds of millions of years, and now we're up to what, 14.2 billion, or is it more now? I don't know. I know the earth was several billion years younger when I was born by scientific uh, explanation than it is now. So you see before you standing somebody who is very, very old in the billions of years, if you can believe our modern day scientists. When you look at God's creation and you reject that there is an intelligent design, you reject the idea that there is a creator from God's standpoint, you are not smart enough to be walking around on your own. He says, men can understand who God is by what has been created so that men are what? Without excuse. We may excuse ourselves and say, well, how could I have known? This is what I've been raised with. This is what I was told all my life. From God's perspective, the only perspective that will count on the day of judgment Men who reject God are without excuse. By understanding what we can know about God and his creation, that's enough to get us started, to start investigating the writings that we have. And when you come to the Bible, there is no document that has ever been this historically accurate, this, this accurate as far as geography, this, ac this accurate as far as true science, not scientific theory. Scientific theory is something that has never been what? 
proved. <laughs> Therefore, it's theory. Do we teach creation in, in, in many schools today? No. What do we teach? We teach, we teach the Big Bang Theory and evolution. I don't know how God created everything. When I look and I see Genesis chapter 1, it looks like everything was created just as it is today, each kind according to its kind. When I, look at the, when I look at the fossil record and I hear people describe, well, we've got this fossil here and we've got this fossil here and then we jump down, we have this fossil here and there's not one missing link, but there are hundreds of missing links to get to this point. And you think, well, I've got all these fossils here, hundreds, I've got thousands of fossils here, but I have all these missing links, not just a missing link, but a missing link between each step of their Grand idea. I know when you start putting them on a big board around the room, it looks like, well, that could be possible. But when you look at it scientifically, it makes no sense. Statistically, and math is something that, I, that one of the few things I understand. Listening to me, you understand I'm not very good at English. I'm not even very good at Texan. <laughs> but math is something I understand. Statistically, the theory of evolution is impossible. Because once you start multiplying the odds of not of having a we found a thousand fossils here. We found tens of thousands of fossils here. We don't have anything here, 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 here. Well, you start putting, well, if I didn't find one of those thousand fossils, the odds of not finding that was one in a thousand. The next one is one in a thousand. You don't add them together, you multiply them and you start doing that. And before long, you have a number too big for the world to hold. And there comes a point where it's statistically impossible. I don't think that Christians should bow their heads in the presence of, of eminent scientists and listen to their theories without thinking about, no, that's, that can't be. I do believe we need to be thinking. And I also believe we need to be understanding this. God created the world in any way he wanted, in any fashion he wanted. However, it actually happened, it's okay with me. <laughs> and if you disagree with me on how it actually happened, we can still be friends. We're not talking about a matter, a, a matter of salvation unless you reject after that God's word and his commandments. And I do believe one of the things we need to understand within the Christian world is we need to be looking for points of agreement, not disagreement. When we have matters of doctrine, what was it Paul said? No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When we talk about doctrine, we cannot back off of it. There are disputable matters. We understand that. And, and, and also, the judge at the end will judge each one of us individually if he's satisfied with that. I, I don't know how many studies I've had with people where, where, with people who have had loved ones who have passed who have not believed the way that that, that uh, we understand the Bible, but God will still judge them, not, not us. And for any one of us to come up with the idea of, well, they're in hell, that's not, that's not your position. There is no problem with your looking at the world and seeing a friend and thinking they are not in a covenant relationship with God as the scripture defines it. They're in, they're in danger. I need to go and seek and say, <laughs> somebody who has passed, why, why would you waste your time with anything other than saying God will make the right judgment? And maybe even adding, and God is on our side. The one who gave his son to die for our sins is not trying to create loopholes for people to stay out of heaven. But he is also the very one whose son said, narrow is the gate that leads to salvation or to life, and only a few find it. That wide is the path that leads to destruction, and many enter thereby. More people will be lost by mathematic conclusion on this. The same population, you talk about many and few, many is more than few. More people will be lost than are saved, according to Jesus. But for us to determine individually which is which, that's not for us. Our job is to seek and save the lost. Our job is to make sure we are in a covenant position with God. Our job is to make sure that we teach the doctrine of the word in a loving way yet unmovable fashion where we have the attitude and the understanding, if God said it, I believe it, 
and this is the only thing I can feed. And so as we talk about different things, and you may not agree with everything, understand the difference between what we can know and what we think we can know, and also what is a matter of salvation and what is not. Um, does anybody here know Mike Schneider from, from the University of Laramie? He was there for years and years. He studied with I don't know how many college students. And he came to Casper, Wyoming, just before we moved to, to Happy Texas. Um, and I just asked him, I said, what is it that, that has allowed you to be so successful in, your, in, in personal evangelism, in, in, in bringing others to Christ? And, and he talked about, and I think I've shared this with you all before, he talked about to him, the key was getting the other person in the same boat. They want to be saved, and we want to be saved. They believe in God, and we believe in God. They may not believe the word of God is infallible, and so this will be one of the things that we have to convince them from the scripture and from just being able to observe the things that we can observe that God has put as evidence so that people would believe in him. But th there are times when somebody says, well, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this particular area, and I'll give you a couple. The, the, the woman's role within worship, as the Bible describes it, musical instruments. It, with, within the worship. And a lot of people are, are very, very concerned about that. And, and Mike had pointed out to me, these are things that, that people will want to talk about. And, and his comment was, if you have one a, a chance to study with them, study the plan of salvation and tell them, we'll look at this later if you would like to. And I've done that. I don't know, not, know on how many occasions. And then we've just looked at the scriptures. But I will tell you this. Once somebody accepts that the Bible is the inspired, infallible word of God, then they will accept what has been taught. But if you start with a point of division instead of getting in the same boat, and you are going in, in, in two boats, get this vision, you're both trying to go to heaven, you're both trying to go in the same direction, but you're whacking each other with the paddles, <laughs> what, what good are you doing? Why not get in the same boat and both be rowing towards a common point? Make sure that we have an opportunity to teach the plan of salvation because people need to be saved. And then you've got all sorts of time to talk about all sorts of other things that, yes, are important. But make sure you take care of first things first. Now, getting back to, the, to this, to this uh, part. Chapter 8, verse 1. God remembered Noah. Think about the last year, the last two years. Maybe you've even been through difficult times, no doubt. Some of you all have that have been much more difficult for you personally. And there are times you feel like you're just about to drown. God remembered Noah. This is, this is one of the most powerful statements, I think, within Scripture. And it applies to you. God remembers you. When you are trying to be righteous and you're trying to do his will, there will still be those who are against you. Satan's always been against God's people. God remembered Noah. He'll remember you. And so we're told that the waters receded. Uh, in verse 15, he's not, now Noah's been on the ark. He went on the, uh, what was it, the 17th day of the second month of the 600th year. He got off the ark on the 27th day of the second month of the 601st year. He's been on the ark for one year and 10 days. That's a long time to be floating on the water, cleaning out the stalls of animals. <laughs> and now he's getting to get off. And what does he do? Well, in verse 15, God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wives and your sons and their wives, and bring out every living creature. Well, Noah came out. He offered a sacrifice to God that was pleasing to him. And the Lord said, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is only evil all the time. When did God curse the ground? May remember? Genesis chapter 3, when man fell, what was, what was the curse that God put upon Adam and men? The ground will yield for you thorns because he was cursing the ground. 
Now he is taking away this curse. Do you remember what one of the curses for the women was? He would greatly increase what? Did he remove that here? Hardly seems fair. <laughs> and yet God is, is ultimately fair. Um, but but I, I do want to point this out. There are farmers that talk about God cursing the earth as if that's still in effect. It's not. It was removed that day. There's something else um, that, that we're just about to hit that's very important. Well, all this is. Never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. We're told that there will come an end time. How are things going to be destroyed at this point? By fire. He's never going to destroy it again, he says, in other places by water. The end time will come. But until that point, um, you don't have to worry, and especially about this. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will it never cease. What does that tell us? Tom and I were talking about this when we were kids. What were scientists afraid was going to happen to the earth? Huh? Yeah, the Ice Age. Newsweek or Time, I can't remember which one, had a big uh, front page deal. The next Ice Age. We were going into the next Ice Age. And as I mentioned, this is billions of years ago when we were young. <laughs> um, and, and now, what are they worried about? Well, let's, what, was it, what were they next worried about? Global warming. And in between that was the ozone layer. The ozone layer was going to disappear and we were all going to fry. And, and, um, and so they got rid of the freon that actually worked. <laughs> um, uh, and then global warming. And, and now it's climate change because they realized, oh, it's changing again. I can remember they put me in as a long-term teacher for a business teacher at uh, Happy High School. And it worked out really good for me because that was one of the areas that they didn't actually have to test on. They had tacks and teaks and all sorts of things. You had to pass the state test in order to get out. But business, they just taught business. And, and since my, my background was in business and my degree was in business, they said, come on in. Then I found out their business course was on teaching technology. I barely got this thing turned on. <laughs> Technology didn't work for me. So I said, I can't teach that. They said, well, just teach whatever you want to. And so I did. One of the things I taught them was global warming <laughs> and global cooling and climate change. And I went back to NASA statistics, which are about as accurate as you can get back to just before the turn of not this last century, but the one before that. And I showed these kids, printed them all off the graphs from NASA of the 30 year cycle of cold to hot, cold to hot, cold to hot. Scientists know this. But it is to people's benefit sometimes to get you worried about something that maybe you shouldn't be worried about. I'm not saying don't be worried about the environment. What did God put Adam and Eve? What were their tasks in the garden? Take care of the garden. God has always, I believe, at least from the very beginning, been concerned with us taking care of his creation. We are not for dirty air or dirty water or anything that, that even compares to that. But the idea that somehow we can thwart God's promise of as long as the earth endures, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. That is immutable. It cannot change. You don't have to worry about the ice caps melting and flooding. Of course, if it flooded, never, I won't get into that. But the point is... <laughs> God will give you what you need for where you are. What time do we have back there? Is that the first bell? Man, you know, I was looking back, and it's just 15 after. It's 15 till. This, this next part is where we want to get to in the next five minutes, and that's this. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. Why did, why did Noah build the ark? What are some of the reasons? What's the most obvious? God commanded. God, God commanded and he did it. He was faithful to God. Why did God command him? Because Noah was found righteous. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7 and see one of the ultimate things that, that God accomplished through Noah. And therefore, Noah was able to do his part. By faith, Hebrews 11 verse 7, Noah, when warned about the things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to do what? Save his family. 
By faith, he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness that comes by faith. In holy fear, he regarded God as holy. That's where it began. He had the ultimate regard for God. He was going to obey God, even if it meant spending 120 years, if our understanding is right, building an ark and having to explain that to all the people, but also having the opportunity to become a preacher of righteousness. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5, God protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. When you think about what your duty is before God, it is immensely important that you obey God in holy fear. For those of us who have families and children, for all of us who have circles of influence with friends, when we build a spiritual structure that God wants us to build, it not only will protect us and save us, but it will save everyone who is associated with us, who we can encourage and who will encourage us, by the way. Your duty on this earth, parents and future parents, first and foremost, is to make sure that your children are saved. Well, I would say first and foremost is to make sure that you are a servant of God and that you are saved, that your spouse is a servant of God and that they are saved in whatever encouraging way you can do that. But you have to make sure that your children are safe growing up and saved when they get to the point where they can make their own decision about whether or not to serve God. It's the only thing that will matter when you kneel before God on judgment. Am I saved? Not are you worthy of salvation because you're not in and of yourself, but God has determined you worthy of salvation. He sealed that by giving you his son in your place to die in your stead. When Noah built that ark, he built the ark in part to save his family. When we build our spiritual lives before God, in part, we are doing so to, to save our families. And so the encouragement for you this morning, whether you have a family or not, you do have a circle of influence, build an ark to save your family. And, and, and you will never be disappointed. The rain's going to come. Noah still went through the flood. You, we've been through the flood the last year in some ways. It's still come. If your ark is watertight, if it's built according to God's specifications, it will float. It'll keep the water out. God will protect you. Not only will you, but your family will be saved as well. I think that's one of the greatest motivations that mankind can have. Build your family and ark. <laughs> Buzz me out, Joe. <laughs> Is that like beam me up, Scotty? I saw he's, he's poised on the edge of the buzzer. <laughs>